This is A Deeper Listen, the show where we talk with musicians about the thoughts and experiences that shape their music. I'm Emily Fox. And today I want to introduce you to Elisa Amador. She grew up touring the U.S. and singing in her parents' Latin folk band, Sol y Canto. She then went on to start a solo career that spanned genres from Joni Mitchell-esque folk. And it's not that I jazz and soul influence tracks. In 2022, she won NPR's Tiny Desk Contest. It was the first Spanish language song to win the award. Cuando miro afuera, cuando miro adentro, cuando miro afuera otra vez. But when she got the call from NPR that she won, she almost told them no, give the award to someone else. Because Amador had stopped writing music in 2020 following the death of a close friend. In the end, she did accept the award and is now out with her first album since winning the Tiny Desk Contest. It's called Multitudes, or in Spanish, Multitudes. I caught up with Amador to talk about how winning the contest allowed her to start a new, refreshed chapter in her music career. I think I'm still learning to say yes and also learning how to say no. I think that those are the two essential parts of navigating a career in music that's sustainable and and respectful to the artist and to the audience alike. When I won in PR Tiny Desk Contest and when I said yes, I told myself that it meant that I needed to basically restart in music. I needed to treat it like a complete restart and do the uncomfortable work of saying no, maybe more than I said yes. Because in the previous, in my previous lifetime as a musician, I had said yes more than no, and it had broken me, and it made me feel unsafe and exhausted and drained. Tell me what all had happened that led up to this idea of just giving up on music. I think that anyone who works in a in a creative or service field can probably understand what might go into the decision of leaving that career, especially in music. I just found myself in a position where I had nothing left to give. It's like you work so hard and you basically pay with your energy and with all of your savings to work <laughs> your mm-hmm. full-time job. And and then in my case, my music is very vulnerable and very, very honest and raw. And so I was performing in front of audiences that weren't receptive to that music. And it just took everything from me. And I, I felt like this job, even though it had been my calling since I was a child, I didn't feel safe in music at the time. And I knew that I needed to step away from it in order to heal and figure out how to be good to myself. And that was exactly when I got the call. So yeah, I was like, maybe they should call someone else. I don't, I don't feel ready. I don't feel well, honestly. But in that moment, I decided that this probably meant that music wanted me to keep going but I needed to find the way to do it on my terms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I'm listening to this album and there's two tracks that stand out that kind of, I seem to, I feel like showcase your frustration with music at the time. One is I need to believe. I need to believe, I need to believe that there's nothing wrong with the songs I'm singing. And the other is love hate song. Tell me more about like what music felt like at the time that you were making these tracks or like those beginning thoughts that inspired these songs. Like what was going through your head at the time? In the case of I Need to Believe, when I won NPR Tiny Desk Contest in 2022, I was 
in the depths of a years long writer's block. Mm. And I felt like, wow, what am I doing? You know, little do these people know I haven't written a song in years. Like, am I even a musician? Am I even a songwriter? And I realized over time that the only way that I could return to songwriting would have to be from almost like a childlike curiosity and not from an approach of, I need to make products. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need to satisfy the beast of <laughs> expectations of me as a musician. I need to, I need to produce products as a songwriter. And I had to step away from all of that and ask myself, how did I ever write songs? Mm. And the answer was that, first of all, I definitely didn't expect them to be good. <laughs> and I definitely didn't expect them to necessarily be heard. And I just wrote them because it was healing for me and it was fun and joyful and creative. And I realized I actually had a lot of different creative pursuits that were just a part of my everyday coping mechanisms, like drawing in my journal and carrying watercolors with me everywhere mm -hmm. <laughs> and and dancing alone in my room every morning. And there were all of these things that I had let go of in the process of entering this period of writer's block. And so first I started dancing in my room again, mm. <laughs> then I started painting and gluing whatever I wanted to into my journal and and then little by little I started to sit down with the guitar and let myself be bad at it honestly and I Need to Believe was one of the first songs that I could finish coming out of that period and it's so literal I don't know if I've ever written such a literal song and it was literally the entries in my journal talking about a hard day on tour so that's where I Need to Believe came from, and, and that's what music felt like in that moment. Last night in Atlanta, I was just so tired. I felt empty, I felt full of lead. I sang to the red glow of the exit sign. As if it were the light at the end How much longer can I go Singing to them if they don't Come back again and again There's something else that I want to ask you about And, and if, if you don't want to go there, we don't have to go there um, But you know, something that also comes up in this album that I think was also, it seems like a part of your writer's block for a while is that you lost a good friend um, who passed mm -hmm. away. Um, and I was reading about it as part of the liner notes. And I just want to share that I, I am just so I am so sorry for your loss, like me reading you. about your process and also reading the lyrics got me really choked up. Um, I definitely Aww. got the tissues when I was listen listening to some of these songs. On Saturday, I wanted to call you. Then I started to cry There's so much that I could have told you But I never tried Now all that's left is all that's left And it'll never be enough And all that we've wept since you left It'll never be enough You know, I'm just curious how you describe your grief process, um, you know, losing your friend, one, I, I can't imagine that. But also, mm -hmm. like, what was it like bringing music into your grieving process, like to write some of these songs that end up on this record? Mm, well, for anyone listening who is grieving, I am holding space with you. And I just I feel so deeply for you because it is one of the hardest, if not the hardest things, the, if not the hardest thing we will do in our lifetime is to let loved ones go um, or to witness them go. And I, I just have so much compassion for whatever the grief process looks like for each person. 
and whatever time it takes for each person to move from one stage to another. And I think that, well, I know that for several years, songwriting, I just couldn't. <laughs> How do you put into words something that is so painful and so bewildering and, and hard to accept, you know? So it took time. It really takes time to heal. But I think, I just know that my ability to love has actually expanded. Mm. And my ability to notice has expanded. And I would trade ignorance for having my loved ones back any day. Um, but I am also honored that I can now write songs that can help hold space for other people who are hurting and hopefully be a part of their healing process too. I mean, what did it feel like for you when, when um, Pasajeras and also Enough were forming? Like, was it therapeutic for you to write those tracks or, you know, just to get them out? Or was it scary also to like address it through music? Yeah, I think addressing grief through music is really scary. At least for me, it definitely is. It's like, it's like another step of accepting your reality. And let me tell you, <laughs> it's hard to accept that reality. It's really hard. So I feel brave every single time I perform those songs. And, but I also try to, try to just like channel so much love to the people I miss through the song. That you ever told me Tuesday on the phone vulnerability and also on this record you know you you wrote about your personal struggles um with depression in the song woke up today woke up today feeling like i'd never be all right and you wrote that you almost didn't record this song but you know what was going through your head and your heart that led you to ultimately decide to to, to record this song and put it on the record yeah. Wow, we're getting into all the deep stuff today. <laughs> um, well, I guess I can't really help it since all of this album is is fr coming from that place. But um, Woke Up Today, yeah, when I wrote it, I thought no one would ever hear it. And I thought it was just um, a song for myself, a coping song for myself. It's very simple, but so honest <laughs> woke up today feeling like I'd never be all right you know that's something that so many people feel um but I really love that it ends with woke up today feeling like maybe I just might and which alludes to the second verse that says find the way to make the day feel better than the night woke up today feeling like maybe I just might Find the way to make the day feel better than the night. I really appreciate how you can both acknowledge the pain and not say, you know, it's all going to be fine, mm. don't worry. But also say, maybe, maybe it's going to be okay. Can, you, can, you, can we hold on to hope together that... It really might get better. It really might. It probably will. <laughs> but when when you're in that place of depression and hurting, sometimes someone telling you it's going to be fine doesn't necessarily reach you. So that concept of maybe, maybe I just might feel better can almost, um, it, it definitely helps me in those moments at least. So I hope it helps others too. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, where do you think that you're at? I mean, just like, you know, dealing with grief, dealing with, you know, just like mental health struggles. Like, where do you feel like you're at today? Mm, today, today I miss, I miss my friend. Yeah. I'm definitely, it's a, it's a harder day, but there are a lot of happy days and I feel so grateful for my community and my family. And I, I just feel like in my personal life, I'm well, I'm really well, and mm-hmm. I feel really surrounded by love. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really focusing on that and, and then just trying to be good to myself. <laughs> Woke up today feeling like maybe I just might. So, you know, KXP, we're all about music discovery. And so I would love for you to give us a music re- recommendation. Who's an artist or, or what's a song, I should say, that you think everyone should hear? A song that you're loving right now or a song that's made an impact on you somewhere along your life? Mm, can I do one in English and one in Spanish? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, wait. Okay. No, actually, I'll do one in Spanish and one in Portuguese. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so one in Spanish is En Huelga by Nicole Siñago, which is Z-I-G-N-A-G-O, Nicole Siñago. I just think it's a really incredible song about learning how to heal from a breakup and learning how to listen to yourself and be good to yourself. And then a song in Portuguese by Tim Bernardes, who I, I think did a KEXP session more recently. He has a song called Fagis. Fa, 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 <laughs> Portuguese uh, is hard. <laughs> yes, I speak Spanish, but well, how do you say that? <laughs> Fazis? <laughs> That's just very, very beautiful, and I love listening to that one. Sofre por imaginar. O pior será que não é cansar e lutar à toa? Se afinal de contas, fases, fases vão passando. Eu não posso mais lutar contra. And then in English. I have always just deeply loved Dusty Trails by Lucius. Oh, no. and wait, wait, no. There's Something About You by Lucius. That's such a good one to put on and remind yourself that you love yourself or that, or to send to a friend when they're down. You're like, there's something about you I can't describe. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Speaking with Elisa Amador, her new record, Multitudes, is out now, and she'll be playing at the Sunset in Seattle on October 1st. Thank you so much for chatting today and for sharing your story and your music with us. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Seattle. I love you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
Next time on A Deeper Listen, we'll hear about a new album that's all about the suffrage movement that gave women the right to vote in August of 1920. We were given the right to vote in 1920, and that that was a victory. But I think it's just sort of the acknowledgement that while that was a victory, there's still work to be done. What is the democracy for which the world is battling, for which we offer up a man power, woman power, money power, our own? That's next time on A Deeper Listen. Before you go, please do me a huge favor and subscribe to this podcast, rate it, and review it. It only takes a minute or two of your time and really goes a long way in helping spread the word about this podcast for free. We don't like throwing lots of advertising dollars at things because KEXP is a publicly funded station. That is where this podcast comes from. We rely on listener support to do what we do. It's a beautiful funding model, and you can help financially support the show with a $6 monthly contribution at kexp.org slash deeper. Or you can help do your part by spreading the word for free by subscribing to this podcast, rating it, reviewing it, share an episode with a friend or your followers. All of that goes a long way. But most of all, thanks for taking a deeper listen.